Hello and welcome to Energy 154 Unit 8. In this unit, I'm going to discuss three challenges to a renewable electricity system. So this is based on a talk I gave uh, based on my research. And um, it sort of gives a different sort of take than um, the sustainable energy without hot air. Although you'll see some similar themes. So the real question I want to answer, um, try to answer today is, can our electrical grid be powered solely by renewable energy? And what are the challenges and what could be some of the solutions to those challenges? So where I want to start is here. So this picture might look familiar to some of you. This um, was the Super Bowl in um, 2013. And during the Super Bowl, half the lights went out in the stadium. And shortly after this, um, there was a press release by Peabody Energy and which is a big coal producer. And the quote went something like this. Coal is the world's fastest growing major fuel and provides more electricity than any other energy source. Without coal, you might as well turn off half the lights, not just for our favorite games, but also for our cities, shops, factories, and homes. So what I want to start with is I want to try to deconstruct this quote a little bit. And what I want to say is that, yeah, the first part of this Coal is the world's fastest growing major fuel and provides more electricity than any other energy source. That's exactly right. Right now it is the world's fastest major growing fuel and does provide more electricity than any other energy source. But I really want to delve deep into the second part of this quote, that without coal, we might as well turn off half the lights, not just for our favorite games, but also for our city shops, factories, and homes. So can we get by without coal and really, can we get by with any, without any fossil fuels? And I'm going to concentrate on the electricity system for this talk. So let's look at the current state of the electricity system. So as you can see, the major components of the electricity system are the 46% coal, the 21% nuclear, 20% natural gas, and 13% other, of which the biggest of that is hydroelectric. So it is true that coal provides almost half of our current electricity use. So that, that part is true. Let's have another little look about our energy system. So there's a few things I wanna, I wanna go over here, but let's first look at this graph in total. On the left here are the major energy sources. On the right here are the major energy uses. And the middle is electric generation. And you can see that the main input to electrical generation is coal. Then we have some natural gas, nuclear, hydro, and then a spat of other small things. The other part of the picture is that um, petroleum is used almost all for transportation and industrial processes. And it's almost the only source used for transportation. So let's take a little bit more um, into a local aspect of this. They did this for all 50 states back in 2008. So if you want to look at your state, you can look that up in Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So for Delaware, it turns out it's even more so that we're relying on coal. But we're also relying a lot on electricity imports. And the petroleum about the, looks about the same. So let's talk about the big goal is to get this chart to be 100% renewable. Okay. So we really want to see if this goal is achievable. So before I talk about um, renewable energy, I want to point out some, a big point here, is that more than half of the energy we use, if we look at this red circle, more than half of the energy that we put into our energy system is rejected energy. And that means waste. And the 41.7, the energy services, that's what the services we actually get out of that energy. So a real thing before we even talk about renewables is we always want to talk about efficiency first. And that's one reason why this course is part of an energy management program at Delaware Tech. We always want to talk about efficiency first. So I want to go over the challenges to 100% renewable electricity, and that'll sort of frame the rest of this talk, is that we, we want to look at a couple different challenges to 100% renewable. The first challenge is resource size i.e., do we have enough renewables? Second challenge is cost. 
And the third challenge we'll talk about a lot is the intermittency of renewable generation, or that the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, and we don't always have enough rain to power our hydro. <clears throat> so the first one we're going to look at is resource size. Okay, so this challenge is resource size. Well, really what we're asking is, are there enough renewables to go around? Or can we really get enough from renewable energy to power our, our complete electric system? So what I want to do is, is look at this through the lens of Delaware. But we could look at this through the lens of any state or any country. But just because since we're located here in Delaware, it's a good, it's a good place to start. So, um, to some statistics, enough sunshine falls on Delaware in three days to satisfy our electricity needs for a whole year. Another way to look at this is maps of how big we need a solar field to be. So, if we look at the area for solar to satisfy Delaware's electricity needs, it's about that big on a map of Delaware in the state. But let's look at this another way. This is a map of um, Wilmington and, and Newark. But really what I want to point out is um, the Delaware Tech campus is right here. So let's look at what, what area we need to cover here to completely power uh, with solar. So this would be the area. So it would be basically if we had from Dell Tech Stanton campus, if we drove all the way to Newark, that would be one side of a square. So let's look at the same thing with wind. So with wind, we need enough wind blows through Delaware's portion of the Atlantic Ocean in 78 days to satisfy our electricity needs for a whole year. So how big of a wind farm would we need off the coast of Delaware? So this is how big off the coast of Delaware we need to satisfy Delaware's complete electricity needs. Let's look at the same picture here. So again, this is the Staten campus. It turns out we need 1.22 times larger than the screen area to cover in wind turbines. And again, these would be placed offshore. But just to give you an idea of scale, we need 1.22 times larger than the screen area to generate enough wind energy to um, satisfy all of Delaware's electricity needs. So Delaware's already taking some steps um, onto this. Um, the Delaware Renewable Portfolio Standard um, notates that 25% of Delaware's electricity has to come from renewable energy and 3.5% must come from solar photovoltaics by 2025. So that's our standard. That's where we're going to. So the next thing I want to talk about is cost. So the cost of renewable electricity um, has been going down in the past couple years. And let me show you some examples. So this is the cost of um, photovoltaic modules or PV modules. And there's two different curves here. But let's first look at the top one. I really like this one because it shows it all the way back to 1976. So if we look at 1976, um, PV panels cost $76.67 per watt. If we looked at 2012, the price is down to 73 cents per watt. So this is a drastic, drastic decrease over that time period. The same can be said for another technology, which is thin film technology. It's following a similar curve. So we'll see if these experience curves continue, but we can see that cost has dropped rapidly. And look, even back from 2005, in 2005 it was $4.34 per watt, and now it's $0.73. Cents. So drastic changes have been happening with cost of PV panels over the past couple of years. The same can be said about wind turbines. Now, I don't have this data as far back, nearly as far back as the uh, PV um, panels, but you can see back in 2008, the average cost of a wind turbine was 1.68. This is million dollars per megawatt, but really it's dollars per watt because the million and mega cancel. And you can see that if you buy an old model in 2013, it drops to 1.05 dollars per watt. And if you buy a new model, 1.32. So the wind price isn't as drastic, but prices still are going down for wind turbines. Now, let's look. The real thing you want to look at a lot of times when comparing different energy sources is what's called the levelized cost of energy, or sometimes it's called the levelized cost of electricity. 
But let's look at this graph of the level as cost of energy. And I want to give you guys a, a couple different um, things here. So let's look at a couple different things. This first bar is the offshore wind. So you can see it has a range of um, $100 per megawatt hour or 10 cents per kilowatt hour to almost 300, 350 um, dollars per megawatt hour. Solar is a similar range. It goes a little bit lower, a little bit under 100. And then onshore wind goes as low as 50. And then the last thing, the cheapest fossil fuel is this natural gas. You can see that this cheapest fossil fuel is very similar to onshore wind with solar and offshore wind being a little more expensive. So we're almost getting we're getting to the point where onshore wind is cheaper than um, fossil fuels. And like I showed before, with the prices in solar and offshore wind dropping, we might get to that point with those two. So another thing to point out is that in January of 2013, we had no fossil fuels installed, but we had um, some wind, biomass, and solar plants installed in the U.S. So this is in the whole U.S. It's just an interesting idea to see where we're going. The previous year, you could see we had lots of units of other things installed. Now, this isn't going to be true for the whole year, but it's just a, something to think about as, as to where we're going as a country. So the third challenge I want to talk about, I'll probably spend the most time on this, is the intermittency of renewable generation. So how I want to introduce the intermittency of renewable generation concept is through a debate. So I just want to show you this debate, but before I do, I want to show, um, I want to talk about who the debaters are. So there's two major debaters that are going to be debating in this video I show you. The one on the left is um, Bruce N Niles, and he was the director of the National Coal Campaign for the Sierra Club, basically anti-coal, so he didn't want any coal plants to be built. And the one on the right is Joe Lucas, and he's the vice president of the Americans for Clean Coal Electricity. And this is the time of the debate. But basically what the, they um, lobby are in part for the coal industry. So you can see that these views would be very different. So let's have a look at what they were debating about. And, and, and wind and solar are used for a totally different kind of electricity in this country. We really have baseload power, sources that produce electricity on demand, and we have intermittent power resources. Okay, wait, I want to interrupt. And I'll tell you, I mean, this is an important story Very because important. there are people who really wrong. love, it is true. John Wellinghoff, head of FERC, last Sunday in the New York Times said, the notion that we can't replace coal plants with wind and solar is flatly wrong. This notion well, of baseload is wrong. That's right. Well, let me tell you this much. I know Basin Electric, a rural electric cooperative in North Dakota. Back three, four months ago, back in January, they had a uh, cold snap in North Dakota. It was 46 degrees below zero. They've made a huge investment in a wind farm up there, 120 megawatts of wind, and they're very proud of it. 46 below zero, they were generating electricity with everything they had just to meet customer demand. And unfortunately, the wind wasn't blowing. So this idea that we are going to take and replace traditional baseload sources with intermittent power resources is just not going to work. Okay, so you saw, you know, it got a little heated. Um, you saw that in the debate. But I want to really harp on the last quote. So this idea that we are going to replace traditional baseload sources with intermittent power sources is just not going to work. So intermittency can be a really big challenge for uh, renewable electricity. So let's delve a little bit deeper into intermittency. So the electricity grid at all times must balance usage and generation. So usage, you can think about, you know, anything that uses electricity in homes, offices, factories, and generation is the power plants. So at all times, we must be producing with the power plants exactly what we're using. So for fossil fuels, this isn't too hard. It is still a challenge, but we can ramp up and ramp down power plants because you can think that we're just shoveling more, more or less fossil fuels into the fire. But for renewables, this is relatively hard because we don't control the fuel source. The sun or the wind or um, water could be the fuel source for 
renewables, and we don't control these. So it's relatively hard, especially with solar and wind power, to um, to control this, um, to, to balance the usage and generation. So let me give you a little note on the um, power units here. So um, 5.2 gigawatts is the average power use of Iowa. And one gigawatt, it turns out, is about the average power use of Delaware. So let's look at these graphs from another researcher. And you can see the scale is 70 gigawatts on the side. So this is actually um, a simulation for California. And let's look at um, the graph a little more closely. We have these seven humps here. So what it turns out is these seven humps are days of the week. And so the usage, the height of the humps, is how much usage the electrical grid has at any given time. And so you can think about that if everyone's sleeping in the middle of the night, our usage is low. So those are the valleys. And the peaks are midday or later in the day, late afternoon usually is when uh, peaks occur. And that's when the peaks are. So we start off with uh, what are called our base load generation sources. So our nuclear on the bottom and our steam coal on the bottom. And then we have combined cycle natural gas. And we have gas turbines. And hydroelectric is what's filling in here. So the base load just run, you know, all the time, 24-7. The combined cycle can go up during the, during, during the peak hours in the day. And the gas turbines and the hydro are really the peaking plants that provide that peaking. So what happens to this picture when we put a lot of renewable energy, uh, namely wind, into the grid? So the picture changes very drastically. So the green here is the wind power generation. And then we have our peaks again. But we also have um, a lot of different things going on. The steam coal, we have to ramp up and down. This turns out it's not the best thing to do for a steam coal plant. Same with the nuclear, we ramp up and down every once in a while. And then we really have a lot of these fill-in technologies. We have the um, solar concentration right here concentrated solar. We have solar photovoltaics. We have some gas turbine here. We have some hydro. But you can see it's a much more chaotic system to control. And this is when we still have some fossil fuels in there. So how do we deal with this intermittency? So there's a couple different um, solutions I want to go over. The first is demand response. So, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about what demand response is. Um, with some thermal energy storage. Second is a large geographic area for renewables. The third is diverse renewable energy sources. And the fourth is electrical storage technologies. So let's delve a little bit deeper into all of these. So let's first look at demand response. So demand response means instead of generating more, let's shift our demand so, or our usage from when the peaks are happening to when electricity um, use is down or generation is up. So we can do this in several different ways. I'm not going to go over all of them, but you can see a couple different ways on the, on the right there. So that's basically what demand response is. Demand response means let's just shift the usage in our homes or our businesses. And that already happens a lot today. Another thing we could do is thermal energy storage. And I like to call this the fire and ice method. So if you think about it, this is a sort of a similar thing to demand response, one, one of the ways we could do demand response. So what we could do is we could have a large thermal energy storage, so maybe just a large brick um, block, or we could heat up our homes a little bit warmer when electricity, um, we, when we don't need to use a lot of electricity. Think of that as the fire, so we can just shift when we're actually going to turn our heaters on. And the ice could be for air conditioning. So this turns out that a couple companies do this, is that you can make big ice bricks at, at night when electricity is cheap and plentiful. And during the day in the peak, you could just use that ice for your air conditioning instead of turning on the air conditioning unit. So it's a, sort of a different way to think about demand response. Another intermittency solution is to spread out your renewable 
generation over a large geographic area. So this was a study um, done by a colleague of mine, Willett Kempton, and collaborators, where they looked at a bunch of different um, offshore wind sites. And you can sort of see it stretches all the way from Maine to the tip of Florida. And what they did was they said, okay, let's, they looked at a couple different, they looked at all of these, but they plotted three different things here. So this is um, the percent of the time at different wind generation capacities. So all the way up here is 100%, down here is 0%, and then these are the mid-range ones. So what this means is that it's generating, if, if we look at the point 0.1, it's generating point 0.1 of its total output, in this case, somewhere around 3 or 4% of the time. Okay, so you can see for the individual wind stations S2 and S10, where S2 is at the tip of Florida, and S10 is um, somewhere either Cape Wind or Deepwater Wind, um, is up here. They have very, very, um, they have lots of zeros where they're not generating anything, and lots of 100%. So what this P grid is, is it's the average of all of these different generations. So what happens is, is these are very variable by themselves. But what happens is, is when you combine them all, we don't get we get a lot of the mid-range ones, and we get much more predictable behavior. So if we spread out all these wind turbines over a large geographic area, what that means is we get much more smoothness in our electricity production. So our wind isn't as jaggy. So we could also introduce different and um, intermittency. Um, solutions such as introducing different technologies. So if we combine geothermal, wind, photovoltaic, solar thermal, and hydroelectric, um, if we combine all of them, this is just an example of one day, we might be able to fill in the grid by combining them. Because if you think about it, it's really windy during storms, but obviously it's not really sunny. So these might be complementary resources. So that's the idea. Other solutions are electrical storage. So this is one example of electrical storage. So electrical storage you can just think of as a battery. When you have too much electricity, you store it in the battery, and when you have too little, you draw it out from the battery. So it's just like a rechargeable battery. So in this case, our rechargeable batteries, though, are in um, electric vehicles. And what we have is we have communication between our ISO, which is our electric company, and our electric vehicles. And that says when to charge our batteries when we have a lot when we have excess electricity and when to discharge our batteries when we need more electricity for the grid so this can be um, very profitable for the car owner as well as the grid so it can be a good arrangement another way to store electricity is to store it through hydrogen so how this works is we have renewable electricity and that usually provides our load which is our usage and when we have too much, we can run that electricity through what's called an electrolyzer. And what an electrolyzer does is it takes in water and splits it into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen we put into storage, the oxygen we just put out into the air. So these can just be hydrogen storage tanks. And then when we want to use the hydrogen and draw it out so when, we're, when we don't have enough electricity, so you can think about this as like discharging the battery, we draw it out and we run it through something called a fuel cell. Well, the fuel cell takes the oxygen in from the air, combines it with hydrogen, makes water, and then makes electricity. So the electricity goes and provides the load. So it's just like a rechargeable battery. We're not, we're just, it's a closed cycle, which means we're not using any material to do this. Um, we're just using water as our input and recycling everything. But it provides it just like, it's just like a rechargeable battery. So I talked a little bit about you know, all of these three challenges. In the next section, I want to talk about um, a way to tackle these three challenges at once. So what I want to talk about now is if we tackle these three challenges at once and we try to figure out a way to do this and so to provide 100% renewable electricity. And so I'm only going to say this once, but um, colleagues in, of mine and I create a model called the Regional Renewable Electricity Economic Optimization Model. 
And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about, is how this model, what were the inputs to this model, what were our assumptions, and um, what did we find when we ran the model. So we looked at what's called the PJM um, portion of the grid. And this is sort of the blue region here. So it incorporates Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Virginia, and some uh, part, parts of other states. So when we did this is we looked at um, renewable electricity generation from solar votes, photovoltaics, offshore wind, and inland wind. So the, just those three. So we didn't take a look at any hydroelectric or geothermal or anything like that. Just those three. And it turns out those are the three hardest to um, to have because they're the most intermittent, they're the most variable. So electrical storage, um, we looked at three different types. The, I talked about two of them already, the hydrogen, the grid integrated vehicles, but we also looked at um, the more expensive kind, which is cent centralized lithium ion batteries. So you can just think about this as storing uh, a bunch of batteries in a warehouse. We looked at, um, for tackling challenge number one, we looked at the resource size limits. So we, uh, the solar um, resource we determined by suitable rooftop area in the region. The offshore and inland wind was determined by suitable sites available for turbines. And the grid integrated vehicle limits were set as the vehicle, full vehicle fleet in the PJM region. So we estimated costs for in 2030 for all technologies. So again, what we really need to challenge, the, the hardest challenge to tackle was the intermittency though. So again, we need to balance usage and generation at all times. And this was, remember, we, we said this was relatively hard for renewable generation. So let's look. So let's try to account for intermittency. How we did this first off, we gathered four years of data. And this was hourly, so we, um, the, the data we calculated was hourly solar production and wind production. Now again, we did geographic, a large geographic area of sites for the wind production for the PJM region. We also gathered the same four years of hourly electrical consumption for the PJM region. So this is the real electrical consumption of the region. The hard part was testing 20 billion combinations. So this was a, for a total of 981 trillion hours of solar, inland wind, offshore wind, and storage. So we tested a lot of different combinations to see what combinations would work. So we evaluated which of these combinations balance electricity production with electricity consumption. So again, we're balancing the pr production and consumption. And our constraint was that it had to do this 99.9% .9 of the time. Then we looked at all the ones that provided these that, that much for 99.9% .9 of the time, and we looked at which ones were the lowest cost. So let's look at our results first. So this graph, the very top portion, um, first off, the bottom is the four years of our study. And the very top portion of this graph shows renewable power generation over that time. And you can see that it's very it's variable, so it's going up and down all the time. But there's also little lulls in the summer. And it turns out that's when the wind really lulls, is in the summertime months. And then it's very it's much higher in the winter months. So then we looked we 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 plotted our energy and storage. So this is how full our batteries are. And you can see this top line, this is when our batteries are very full. Now remember, it's not always batteries, it's sometimes grid energy vehicles or hydrogen. We can just think of them as batteries. So this very top line is when they're full. And again, the batteries are draining much more in the summertime months. So the summertime months are when we're really constrained. And then since we're only doing 99.9% .9 of the time, we do have some fossil backup. And you can see that it turns on mostly in the summer near July or August months. So that's sort of um, how our four years could look. So let's delve a little bit deeper into this. Let's look at a couple of different weeks here. Let's first look at the week of February 26th, 1999. So in the winter in a relatively easy time. So what we have here is a week plot, just like we had um, before when we were first discussing the intermittency challenge. And we have seven humps. And so those are, this. the black is our load in those seven humps. We also have a couple different um, 
renewable energy generation sources. The first one is the cyan color, which is offshore wind. Second is the pinkish color, which is onshore wind. And third is the photovoltaics, which is yellow. So you can see that this, this system that turned out is wind dominated. So we do have a little bit of solar, but it's mostly wind dominated. So we also see that most of the time, our generation is well above our usage. Remember, the black line's our usage, and our generation is sometimes well above it up here. So that's, that's one um, problem that we ran into. But actually, it's not necessarily a problem. We'll talk a little bit about how we um, dealt with that later. But so, so let's look a little bit more deep into this and how it interacts with storage. So here, so we have the same black line, and that's our usage or our load. And then we, with the green, is the renewable generation provided to load or storage. So that's basically the used generation. So if it's below the black line, it's provided to load or usage. If it's above, it's provided to storage, which basically just means we're charging our batteries. So we can see at the very beginning here, we're charging our batteries because this green is above the black line. And then it turns into yellow um, because our batteries are fully charged. The yellow is the spilled renewable generation. So what that means is that our batteries are fully charged and we're providing all the energy that all the electricity that we're using or the load. So we have to spill this generation. So what happens is at, at this one point here is that we don't have enough generation to meet load. So we have to discharge our batteries or use some of the energy in our batteries. And that's the gray here. It's small. And then after we use some of this, we charge up our batteries with the green here above the black line. So you can see that we're spilling a lot of energy here. So let's look at another week. So this is, again, our four-year plot. Let's look at the, a very challenging week, which is the week of August 23rd, 2002. So here we can see, again, the same seven humps, just for a different week, so the humps look a little bit different. But our generation is very low, comparatively to the winter week. So um, we have very low generation. So let's look at what happens. So in this case, what happens is we have a lot of the gray area. We're drawing a lot from storage. And it turns out we're charging a lot too. And we're only right here, we're only spilling a tiny bit, a tiny fraction of the time. So um, we can also see that this little red portion here that's our fossil generation. So it turns out our, our batteries couldn't handle outputting all that energy at this time, so we had to output a little bit of fossil. So that's where our fossil generation comes in, that 0.1% of the time. So this is just looking at it in a different way. This is the four years, but this is with our green and yellow um, plot. Um, and what we can see is that there's lots and lots and lots of yellow here. And as mentioned before, it's a lot, that's spilled generation. So what we did in this model was we put up this spilled generation into heating for homes and businesses. So we said, okay, normally, you know, we just, we're just going to use this for electricity. But when we have spilled generation, instead, we'll just use that for heat. So let's look at the results we got out of this model and what the costs were. So if we look at, in the PJM grid, the wholesale electricity cost, which basically just means, um, you know, before the company gets the electricity to the doorstep of, of your house, what they pay. We're going to say it's $0.08 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, so that's what we're paying wholesale right now for electricity in this region. So if we included external costs, so what I mean by external costs are the health costs and the environmental costs associated with burning fossil fuels um, of the PJM mix. So if we include those costs, our actual cost of electricity would be 17.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So 
when we look at the cost of the Riom model, um, when the excess electricity is used for heating, these are our results. Our centralized battery storage, so remember these are just batteries and warehouses, the most expensive storage we looked at, was 20 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. So when we looked at hydrogen storage, it was 13 cents per kilowatt hour. And we looked for grid integrated vehicle storage, it was 11 cents per kilowatt hour. So we're not definitely not at the 8 cents per kilowatt hour. But we are, we are lower than the external, if we include external costs for the wholesale electricity. And we're much lower than that. And the other interesting thing to point out is that both hydrogen storage and grid vehicle storage, even though they're very different storage models, are relatively close, close in cost. So in closing, I want to revisit this quote. So let me read it one more time. Coal is the world's fastest growing major fuel and provides more electricity than any other energy source. Without coal, you might as well turn off half the lights, may as well turn off half the lights, not just for our favorite games, but also for our cities, shops, factories, and homes. So this is how I would change this quote. I would say right now, coal is the world's fastest growing major fuel and provides more electricity than any other energy source. But with the proper planning, Renewable electricity could provide reliable power to our entire electric grid at prices comparable for today. So I want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues at the University of Delaware, Will Kempton, Dana Verone, Leon Mock, Deanna Sewell, and Heather Thompson for this work. Um, I also want to thank the supercomputer that we used um, for this work from the Extreme Science and Engineering Discovery Environment, and that's funded by the National Science Foundation. So for this discussion board for Unit 8, we talked a lot about the three challenges here So, for, um, for achieving 100% renewable generation. Which of these three challenges, of which resource size, cost, and intermittency are, of achieving 100% renewable generation is the most difficult to overcome, and why? And I also want to let you know, if you're interested, I do have some support slides following this that will be posted with the um, PDF of the slides um, that go over a little bit more of the details of this model. And you can also look at the paper, it's for free. Um, just search the, the, the title here and um, the full paper will come up with all the assumptions for this work.